Well, it was almost a year ago to the day that a church planting friend reached out and invited me to take a six-week course called Living the True You. And this six-week course, you were going to learn how to craft a unique prayer that was unique to you and also craft identity statements about yourself through the study of scripture and through deep prayer. So I signed up. I took this course, which really changed my life in many ways. And part of that class was that towards the end, you had to go away on a retreat, either for a day or overnight. And in order to craft these identity statements, you need to get away and just pray, 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 study the scriptures, and ask the Holy Spirit, who did you uniquely create me to be? And I'll never forget that day up in Traverse City, Michigan. I went away for the day. I drove along Lake Michigan. I hiked the sand dunes, went up to the top, looked over Lake Michigan, and I had this prayer on repeat all day long. Holy Spirit, who did you create me to be uniquely? Please show me through your word who I am. And there were 12 identity statements that came out of that day, but one was the Holy Spirit revealed precious, you are a passionate preserver of truth, and you will guard against my truth being distorted in this world. Well, we are on week three of our series in Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches that Jesus wrote to his church's end. As I have been studying this letter to the third church in Pergamum, God has reminded me over and over again, precious, remember, you are a passionate preserver of my truth, and you will guard against my truth being distorted in this world. Because in this passage today, there is some hard truth that Jesus had to speak to his church. And what I want you to hear this morning more than anything else is not my heart and not my words, but Jesus' heart and Jesus' words to his church. Because what we need to remember is the church was founded on Jesus Christ. It was founded by Jesus Christ. The church was his idea, and he loves the church more than any of us ever could. And sometimes when you love someone and you care about them so deeply, you have to speak some hard truth to them. But the wonderful thing about Jesus is that he doesn't just speak hard truth. At the end of each of these letters, he said, if you are faithful, if you do what I'm telling you, I have a reward waiting for you. So before we go any further, I want to pray with you today that the Holy Spirit would do a work in your heart. I have praying, been praying for you all week that the Holy Spirit would cultivate the soil of your heart to hear his seeds of truth today and to receive them. And on the screen behind me, there are two verses from Psalm 139. This is going to be our prayer this morning, straight from Scripture. Would you repeat these words with me? Search me, O oh God, say them with me, and know my heart. Try me. And know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Well, I invite you to grab your Bibles. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. If you're joining us online this morning, I want to say welcome. Thank you for spending your morning with us. And grab your Bible. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. We are starting at verse 12. This is the letter Jesus wrote to the church in Pergamum. And we can sum up this church as this church was known as the worldly church. 
But starting in verse 12, let's see what Jesus said. He said, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp, two-edged sword. So Jesus starts this letter to his church in Pergamum by introducing himself as the one who has a sharp, two-edged sword. If you look back at Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, we know Revelation was written by the apostle John when he was on the island of Patmos. He received this vision of the Lord. And in Revelation 1, 16, it says he saw Jesus in his right hand. Jesus held the seven stars, and coming out of his mouth, was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Jesus wanted to remind his church in Pergamum of who he was and how powerful his words were. His words carry weight and authority. Continue on with me in verse 13. As we go on, we're actually going to separate the rest of this passage into four different sections. And if you got a bulletin this morning on the back, there's some sermon notes. Each section is going to have a different heading, starting with the letter R. So if you're someone that likes to fill in the blanks, this is your time. First of all, in verse 13, we're going to see that Jesus recognized this church. He recognized what they were doing well. He said in verse 13, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name. You did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So Jesus started off telling his church in Pergamum, I recognize, I acknowledge your faithfulness. You're doing so well at holding fast and clinging to my name, even in the midst of persecution and death. Now, in order to fully understand what this means, what this letter meant, we have to look back at the cultural context for where this church was located. All of these seven churches that Jesus wrote to were located in what we know of today as the country of modern-day Turkey. And um, this city, Pergamum, was the political capital of Roman, the Roman province of Asia the Less. Attalus III, the king of Pergamum, had gifted Rome his territory, and it allowed Rome to start spreading further to the east. And because of that, it allowed Rome to prosper and grow even more. So that's why there were, at that time, three temples dedicated to the worship of the Roman Empire. This was a Greek city. Pergamum was noted for culture and education. And it housed one of the largest libraries of that day with more than 200,000 volumes. It was known for politics and religion. But Pergamum was in many ways a stronghold of satanic power. This city was at the forefront of the most pagan, false religion. Now, Pergamum was a very religious city. It had temples to many Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. To name a few, people would come to Pergamum to worship the god of Zeus. Now, Zeus was known as God. He was the God, the king of kings, is what people came to worship Zeus as. But we know as followers of Jesus, that is not true. There is only one king of kings, and that is Jesus Christ. But people came to Pergamum to worship Zeus. They also came to worship Dionysus. This was the god of wine and festivity. So if you wanted to have a celebration, a good time, you came to Dionysus to worship him. Then there was the Roman goddess, Athena. She was the goddess of wisdom and strategy. If you had a hard decision to make in your life, you would go and worship Athena. There is the goddess Demeter. She was the goddess of the harvest. If you wanted to have a good crop that year, you would go and worship Demeter. And there's also Asclepius. He was the god of medicine. So if you were looking for a healing, 
in your life, you would go and worship Asclepius. People came to Pergamum from all over to worship all these different gods. But what we know is that back in the beginning of the Bible, in Exodus 20, listen to what God told his people. The very first commandment that was given in the Ten Commandments, God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The very first commandment that was ever given is you shall have no other gods before me. If you look in the New Testament to 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. So as you look at scripture, we know that God says you shall have no other gods before me. And the Christians who lived in the city of Pergamum were daily faced with the question, who are you going to worship? There was a lot of gods and goddesses that they could be worshiping. But Jesus praised them and he recognized them because he said, I know where you dwell and that you're holding fast to my name. There were a lot of other names that they could be clinging to. So these believers lived where Jesus said Satan's throne dwelled. So you can imagine it would be a difficult place to live out your faith. But a difficult environment never justifies compromise. A difficult environment never justifies compromise for a follower of Jesus. What is compromise? Well, here, compromise would mean lowering your standards on things that you know are wrong because of worldly influence around you. Now, Jesus named one specific man, Antipas, in verse 13, who he called his faithful witness. Those words, faithful witness, were also used for Jesus in Revelation 1.5. And we don't know for sure, but some scholars believe that Antipas could have been the pastor of the church in Pergamum. This man followed Jesus faithfully, and he witnessed to the truth of who Jesus is. Even though he lived in the city where Satan's throne dwelled, he did not give in to the worship of the pagan gods. He stood firm against the attacks of the enemy. In fact, he lived out the meaning of his name fully because the name Antipas means against all. Antipas did not compromise. And because he held firm to his faith, he's believed to have been burned on a pagan altar in AD 92 for not worshiping the false pagan gods. Now, despite these Christians holding fast to their faith, there were still a few things that Jesus called out against them. Just because they lived in a difficult environment did not excuse the few things that Jesus had against them. And this is where Jesus starts talking about the hard truth and saying, because I love you, I'm going to correct you here brings us to our second section with the heading reprimand. Jesus reprimanded this church and verses 14 through 15 follow along with me. Jesus said, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So you also have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Jesus loved his church enough to reprimand them, correct them, because they were allowing some inside his church that held to this teaching of Balaam. 
So let's talk about this man, Balaam. Who is Balaam? Well, if you go back to the beginning of the Old Testament in the book of Numbers, chapters 22 to 25, you will find out all about this man, Balaam. He was known to be one of the most evil, corrupt men, evil prophets. He was hired by Balak, who is the king of Moab, to curse the Israelites, but he couldn't curse them because God wouldn't allow someone to curse his people that he had blessed. And so because Balaam couldn't successfully curse Israel, he combined the sins of sexual immorality and idolatry to please the king of Moab, Balak. And Balaam encouraged Balak to put this stumbling block before Israel. And the way that it happened was that the woman of Moab, this foreign people, started enticing the sons of Israel, started intermarrying with God's chosen people. And when they did that, they introduced sexual immorality and idolatry, the worship of false gods. And this next thing I'm going to tell you is really hard to hear. Because of that, 24,000 Israelites were murdered by God in Numbers chapter 25 because they joined themselves to the worship of Baal. That seems pretty harsh. Why would God murder 24,000 people? His people. It's because God takes sin seriously. He does not tolerate sin. He will not share himself. I mean, he, he will not share you with the worship of false gods. He alone is the one true God. There were those within this church who were holding to that teaching, and they were practicing these things. In fact, sexual immorality marked the whole culture of the Roman Empire. Sexuality was just taken for granted in that culture. And if you tried to live according to biblical standards, then you were considered strange, like an outcast. But let's look at our world today, because we're not much different. Our culture tells us, live all for yourself. It's all about you, 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 whatever makes you happy. In fact, worship yourself, right? Isn't that what you hear a lot? You see it on clothing, you see it all over the media. It's all about you. But scripture says in Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucify your fleshly desires. Don't be like the world. Our culture says it's okay to sleep with your boyfriend or your girlfriend before you're married because you have to see if you're compatible. I mean, it just makes sense. But scripture says, the marriage bed is to be kept undefiled in Hebrews 13, 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Our culture says love is love. A man can marry a man, a woman can marry a woman. As long as they're fully committed to each other, love is love. That's not what God says. In Leviticus 18.22, it is clear you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. These are ways in which our world struggles with sin. This sin that was running rampant back then in the city of Pergamum in the Roman culture, it is today with us. Specifically, it was noted by Jesus at the end of this verse that there were some holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, a few weeks ago, Pastor Jonathan said um, on the letter to the church in Ephesus, it brought up the Nicolaitans, and he said, we're going to wait till week three when he, we study the church in Pergamum, and we'll talk more about that. So who are the Nicolaitans? What do they believe? 
What do they teach? Because they were coming into Jesus' church. Well, they believed and taught that the body was separate from the soul. They weren't connected. So because of that, it didn't matter what you did with your body. So the Nicolaitans deliberately sinned by eating food that was sacrificed to false gods, and they slept with temple prostitutes, believing that it was okay. And these people were inside the church. Now, you may be thinking, wow, this church has major problems. Like, it's a good thing Jesus wrote this letter to the church in the city of Pergamum because they had issues. But we're going to bring it a little bit more close and personal because I believe that if Jesus wrote a letter to First Baptist Church of Payton City, he may say some of the same things to us. I'm sure he would point out areas where we are struggling and compromising. And he might start it by saying, stop straddling the fence. Stop straddling the fence in your relationship with me because I don't want part of you. God wants all of you. God doesn't want a portion of you. Sometimes we just sit on the fence, right? We think, God, it's only 5%. Just going to blend in a little bit with the world. No, God doesn't want a part of you. He doesn't want a portion of you. He doesn't even want the majority of you. God wants all of you. A difficult environment never justifies compromise. So let's look at some of the ways that our church, actually the church globally around the world, that we're compromising right now. Because we don't preach a whole lot anymore. Kind of straddle the fence. You don't hear a lot of churches preach on the holiness of God. That God is set apart from this world. That he can't tolerate sin. We don't teach on the reality of sin. That God's wrath is poured out against sin. It was through Jesus. We don't teach on the reality of hell anymore because we don't want to offend people. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. We teach a lot that this is where we compromise Jesus came to make us happy, healthy, and wealthy, right? Do you hear a lot of that coming from the church globally today? That's not what Jesus teaches. If you read the Bible, Jesus says, following me will be hard, and there will be suffering. You have to count the cost. It's not going to be easy, but in the end, it will totally be worth it. And your reward will be beyond what you could ever imagine. Sometimes, even in the church, we make an idol of America as a nation. We look to our present to be somewhat of a savior for us. And while I am totally proud to be an American, I am. Followers of Jesus sometimes... Um, worry about the things of this world more than they do about their heavenly home. You're only a temporary citizen on this earth. Your citizenship is in heaven as a follower of Jesus. Don't idolize America. So that's how the church globally can compromise sometimes. But let's bring it even closer. How do you compromise today in your own walk with the Lord? Now, you may think, hey, God, <laughs> I'm doing really good. I'm giving you 80% of me. Look at that one over there. They're only giving you 50. I'm giving you 80. Don't compare yourself to your brothers and sisters in Christ. You worry about you. Some of you are still trying to hold on to the pleasures of this world, even if it's 1% or 2%. 
God wants you all in. Now, this week in my preparation, I, I had to do some deep digging in my own life because I have no business standing up here in front of you teaching and preaching if the Holy Spirit has not first convicted me through his truth. Hey, precious, this is where you're compromising. You're compromising in some areas. You need to do a self-check. And I've spent more than a few days this week on my knees, in my prayer closet, in repentance, as the Holy Spirit has revealed, precious, you can't play around with the things of this world. You can't straddle the fence. I need you all in. And as I repented, I decided to take it a step further. That was vulnerable. I shared with my own husband areas that I know I compromise and I need to fight against because I need someone to hold me accountable. And that's not easy because sometimes there are secret sins that you think nobody else will know about. Except there's always someone who knows. God knows and he sees everything. And I had to vulnerably share with my husband these are some areas that I've been compromising. I need you to help hold me accountable. So right now, I want you to focus on you. We're going to give a few examples of how maybe you're compromising in life and playing around with the things of this world. Sometimes I see Christians on social media asking for prayer requests. And um, they kind of straddle the fence because they don't just ask for prayer. They also add on, oh, and send good vibes my way. But you know, good vibes is actually rooted in a totally false religion called Buddhism. And it crushes me to think that followers of Jesus would think that they have to add good vibes into their request for prayer because they don't believe that prayer on its own to the one true God, it's powerful enough. Don't play around with the things of this world and mix them in. Maybe you compromise when it comes to the media, which you watch on TV or on your phone or on your computer. You watch TV shows, movies that have um, partial nudity in them. Or maybe swear words taking God's name in vain and you think, nobody will see. It's just me. Nobody knows that I'm looking at pornography on my phone. I can delete it when I'm done. But you're compromising. You're playing around with things over here that you shouldn't. God wants you all in. Maybe it comes to forgiveness. You compromise on forgiveness in your life because the world is saying, be bitter. Be angry. Hold on to that unforgiveness and resentment. Just do it. They don't deserve your forgiveness. And God is telling you, no, forgive. Forgive, be all in, because you will never experience freedom until you forgive. Don't compromise in those areas. Maybe you compromise when it comes to your thoughts and your words. Nobody knows what I'm thinking except someone always does know. What about with your words? The world would tell you, complain, say those bad words, just swear, get angry. God tells you to guard your words, guard your thoughts. Tax season is coming up. What about some of us who just want to straddle the fence here and fudge the numbers on our tax return to get a little bit more in or so that we don't have to pay into the government because we don't even trust the government. You're compromising in that area. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's cheating on a test at school. Don't compromise. Jesus called out the sin in his church and he reprimanded them because that is what you do when you truly love someone and you care about them. But the great thing about who Jesus is, is he never leaves you hopeless or helpless. 
He always provides a remedy, a solution to our problem of sin. And that brings us to the third section, the heading being remedy. Jesus said in verse 16, therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus' remedy for his church was to repent. Turn from the things of this world. Turn from sin. Turn from self and turn to me, your Savior. Jesus said, if you don't, I will come soon and I will make war with the sword of my mouth. He's reminding them again how powerful his words are. His words were used to create the world and put life into existence. He shows he's the only one who has ultimate power and authority. Now, you don't hear many churches today preach on the word repentance, but I love this word. And it is so important for followers of Jesus because often we think repentance has to do with salvation, and it does. But keep in mind that in this letter to the church in Pergamum, these are Christians. These are followers of Jesus that he's writing to, and he's calling them to repentance. Repentance is something that followers of Jesus need to practice daily. It's a choice daily. Every time we're tempted to turn from sin, turn from self to our Savior. Now, I think a trap that many believers fall into because I have fallen into this trap is thinking, well, I can just sin because God will forgive me as long as I repent afterwards. But I want to remind you of what Paul says in Romans 6, 1 through 4. Paul says, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Brothers and sisters, don't cheapen the grace of God in your life. Don't take advantage of God's grace by sinning. Consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, Jesus closes out this letter, and this last section that he leaves them with, the heading is the reward. The reward for living in true repentance and faithfulness. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Jesus' reward for his church for living in repentance and faithfulness to him alone was to receive some of the hidden manna. And you may be thinking, hidden manna? That's totally not a great reward. But to the church in Pergamum, they knew what this meant. They knew because it took them back to the Old Testament and remembering their ancestors, the Israelites, when they came out of their slavery in Egypt and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they had nothing to eat, but God provided manna from heaven that sustained them, it satisfied them. And then as you go into the New Testament in John 6, 41, Jesus says, I am the bread of of life. I will satisfy not just your physical longings, I will satisfy your spiritual longings too. So in other words, when Jesus was saying, I will give you some of the hidden manna, he was saying, your reward for being faithful is I will give you myself. Church, there could be no better reward 
than Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is saying, I will satisfy all your longings. I will provide for you. I am your reward. And can I just tell you, if you have Jesus, you have it all. That was a great reward, but Jesus didn't even stop there. He gave them another one. He said that he would give them a white stone. And in the ancient world, the use of a white stone had many associations. A white stone was used as a ticket to a banquet, as a sign of friendship. It was evidence of having been counted or as a sign of acquittal in a court of law. A white stone was also given for achieving victory. The stone allowed entrance to the feast of victors. Jesus was saying, you live in repentance and faithfulness to me, I will give you myself and I will give you a white stone that allows you entrance into the feast of victors. And the color white is significant because it represents righteousness. And we know that we are only made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. But it goes on to say, on that stone is a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Jesus was saying, I will give you a new identity. Having a new name means you're loved and you're chosen. Think about some of the people in scripture that were given a new name. Abram's name was changed to Abraham. God changed Sarai's name to Sarah. He changed Jacob's name to Israel. He changed Saul's name to Paul. And every time a name was changed, so were their choices in life. When your name changes, so do your choices the way that you're going to live. So what does all of this mean for us today? I think I would sum it all up by saying, church, let's stop straddling the fence. Let's stop straddling the fence because the things of this world, they'll never satisfy Stop holding on to the things of this world. What are you holding on to? Even just two, three, one percent even that you need to let go of. The more devoted you are to Christ, the more different you will look to the world. Now, Jonathan said this earlier, that the Greek word for the word church in the New Testament is the word ekklesia. It means the called out ones. And as the church, as followers of Jesus, we're called to live for eternal things, not earthly things. So what does it look like for you to live as the called out ones? This fall, when we moved back to the valley, our oldest daughter, Zoe, she had a hard time the first few months with readjusting the transition to a new school, to making new friends. And... Um, one day when I picked her up from school, she just looked totally discouraged. And um, I asked Zoe, hey, Zoe, how was your day at school today? And she said, well, Mom, there's this girl at school who was trying to get me to swear, to say God's name in vain, but I knew it wasn't right. And um, she kept saying, Zoe, just do it. Just do it. No one will ever know. She said, Mom, she even told me, your parents will never know. They're not here. They'll never know. Just do it. Blend in with everyone else. But Zoe didn't. And so because of that, this girl decided, we're going to start calling her the Jesus girl. Hey, guys, look, there's the Jesus girl. She won't say these bad words like the rest of us. Hey, Jesus girl. And as Zoe was telling me this, tears were coming down her face. She was totally discouraged. And in that moment, okay, mama bear instincts come out, right? How dare someone do that to my daughter? But got it under control, realized, and said to Zoe, Zoe, that girl doesn't realize 
that she actually gave you the best compliment that you could ever receive. What she meant for evil, God was saying, no, Zoe, remember, you're the called out ones. You're my called out ones. You will look different from the world. And what once was tears streaming down her face turned into a big smile. And she thought, and we talked about it, let them call me a Jesus girl all they want. Let them bring it because I'm the called out one. I'm not going to be like the rest of this world. Church, what does it look like for you to live as the ecclesia, the called out ones in your workplace, at your school, at a sports game, at the grocery store, maybe even in your home? of unbelievers. Don't join yourself back to the world to which God has redeemed you from. He's pulled you out of. We're going to close by asking two questions. If you got a bulletin this morning, they're on the bottom of your notes. And I actually want you to write out the answer. The first one being, in what area of my life have I been compromising? It's called a self-check. And I told you I did it on myself this week. And it doesn't always feel good because it reveals where we need Jesus to do a work in our heart. Write it down. In what areas have you been compromising? And if you want to take it to the next step, then share it with a trusted friend who will help hold you accountable. And then ask yourself the question, am I all in? Am I all in? Am I willing to give up the things of this world and be all in for Jesus? Now you may be thinking, this is way too hard, precious. You don't know my workplace. You don't know my school. And you're right. It is too hard for you to live this way on your own. You can't. You're not strong or capable enough. But as a follower of Jesus, you were given the Holy Spirit who is called your helper, and he's waiting for you in those moments when you're so desperately tempted to give in. He's waiting for you to call out and say, help, help, because sometimes those are the only words we can utter out of our mouth in that moment. But the Holy Spirit is waiting, and he's ready He's the one who can help you stand strong when you're tempted to compromise. The world, the things of this world, will never satisfy, but the word will. Jesus said in John 1.1 1, 1, that he was the word that became flesh. The world will never satisfy, but the word Jesus Christ, he always will. Now you may be feeling kind of heavy because I felt very heavy this week as I was studying this passage, but um, sometimes I think we always want to leave church feeling really good about ourselves and happy, and that's not always bad, but can I say sometimes it's good to leave church too, not happy, but humbly is we recognize who we are before a holy God and we see all he has done on our behalf. Will you stand with me as we close? Would you bow your heads? If you are a follower of Jesus and you have heard his words today, You've listened to them and are ready to respond in repentant obedience. Then I invite you as his follower to not raise one hand, but 
both of your hands today as a sign of complete surrender. As a sign to say, God, I'm holding nothing back. And if that is you today and you want to live in repentant obedience and faithfulness to him, repeat this word, Jesus. I have heard and I have listened. I repent of my sin and living for the things of this world. I return to you, Jesus, the word who will always satisfy. Help me to stand in your truth with grace and love and not compromise in this world. I need you, Holy Spirit my helper, my comforter. In Jesus' name, amen. And with your eyes still closed, maybe you are feeling for a first time today a pull on your heart and you recognize that you are a sinner in need of a savior, that nothing in this world is truly satisfying that deep longing you have. Know this. The sin you struggle with is real. Hell is a real place. And Jesus is the real Savior. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want to confess your sin and believe on Jesus Christ to save you, from your sin's punishment, then I invite you to raise up both of your hands today as a sign of complete surrender and repeat this prayer. Jesus, I need you. I can't save myself. I confess and repent of my sin. I believe that you died on the cross in my place and rose again. I believe that you alone are the way, the truth, and the life. Will you save me? I give you all of me today and declare at this moment that you have full control over my life. Thank you for saving me and making me whole. In Jesus' name, amen.